Brannon, and I am a dance movement therapist, a licensed counselor. My first job um, working with people surviving trauma and eating disorders was about five years ago now. So I've been in the field, actually more than that, six years. How was your experience working with eating disorders clinically? It was completely new to me in terms of clinically, um, because my internship, my clinical internship was at a hospital and those diagnoses were more uh, psychosis based. And so this was the first time dealing with what we sort of say like normal to rot neurotic range which means like people that can be functioning in the world a little bit more higher functioning although you know we're all functioning at the level that we can but it was completely new to me because these were women that you know were kind of high powered had high powered jobs had you know full lives and then the eating disorder was just the thing that was holding them back from living a full and whole life. What common themes uh, did you find in people suffering from eating disorders? The theme of control, for sure. Like I, I would say that control is kind of on the surface um, where, you know, food is something that we need. It's an essential part of living. And so with some childhood experiences where they did not have control over what happened, the food or really any, any control over aspects of their life, food is something that we come in contact with every day in order to keep living. So there is an aspect of using the food as a sense of, okay, well, I can control how much I intake or how much I, you know, output. Um, and so that was a huge theme. Another theme is just physically, energetically, emotionally taking up space. Um, there's this sense of like, I can't even developmentally become or grow. I can't even become bigger or expand because food is you know nourishing and it helps us grow in each day so there's this theme of like i i want to continue to be small and not just with anorexia but with bulimia as well there's a sense of like developmentally being small like wanting to kind of t turn in on themselves um like a sense of secrecy a sense of like holding things in like not taking up space and so with my work as a dance movement therapist the body of course is like the the battleground because the body is the thing that we are trying to create a more healthy relationship with and there tends to be like a war that happens i mean in the mind and in the body so just a a simple exercise of taking up more space physically could be really healing. And another theme is just trauma tends to be the underlying cause um, or the, the root. Not everyone with an eating disorder has trauma, but I do think having the eating disorder within itself is traumatic because you are internally trying to process something that's not the healthiest you know, and it's the constant kind of battle within. People who did have trauma, what kind of trauma or family system um, did you find usually cause people to acquire an eating disorder? There definitely is a wide range. There's no kind of like one size fits all model with trauma. And I did notice there's a lot of sexual abuse, um, meaning there was something that happened in, in this person's childhood, usually or at a young age, either that happened directly to them or that they witnessed in the, in the family. With that sort of abuse, that person's body is essentially stolen. There's a moment where their sovereignty, their power, their 
their ad their um, agency is stolen from them and so that's where the manifestation of the control comes from because they think that the the need to have something in their life that they can actually have agency over there's a there's a way to reclaim that even if it's in an unconscious and sort of not the healthiest way there is a um kind of roundabout way of trying to reclaim that so there's a lot of sexual abuse that i worked with um and then sometimes just emotional abuse of neglect not being seen like i said maybe there was someone else in their family that took up more space emotionally or the mother or a parent was a little bit more narcissistic um meaning the world kind of revolved around the parent and then the child had to be more of a parent role mm-hmm. um so those kind of like root issues of like how things manifest it was clear like you put it together so well because last year i went to a seminar which was on eating disorders and dreams and oh. they talked a lot about parentification and how that they found that to be a really common um family system between parent and child that um a lot of people who have eating disorders had that issue in their yes. life there's this sense of like again this um this like i don't have any choice and so the thing that i can make a choice three times a day or five times a day is with food and so that's that's what's in front of me and i guess that's where it lends to like more substance abuse too if people turn to drinking but i do think with a lot of mental health um issues um choice is like a huge part of the healing because in the end or in the beginning they didn't have a lot of choice or agency and a lot of the healing that i try to do with my clients is give them tons of options because they never had that mm-hmm. but that sense of i don't have a choice if i'm a kid and i have to survive I have to do this thing to keep going whether that is step into the parent role and worry about everyone, caretake everyone. Um and then there tends to be like I forget about myself because I'm focused so much on keeping everyone else safe. And so there's a reclaiming of the safety too. When I was younger and I and I had an eating disorder and even to this day I still have like thoughts that will go through my head. But it's like now I know why that happened and I yeah. see like the things that happened in my family. So like there's so much of what you're saying where I'm like, yeah, that was my experience too. So For sure. <laughs> and if you think about not just interpersonally within the family, but like concentric circles outward with the society and I mean I think sixty I'm not sure of the the latest statistic but i think 60% of people with eating disorders are women and but i do think men who are dealing with that it, that number is rising as well but if you think about just the standards that are created in society around body image and like what is beautiful and whatever the standard body is whatever a healthy body looks like it's just it's so much pressure and so I worked a lot with adolescent girls too and just their generation is even more connected to society through their phones through their devices so it's like constantly being bombarded with like thin um there were like reddit pages just dedicated to anorexia because people who are actively in their eating disorder like try to enable each other you know and Anyway, so just like the concentric circles of yes, there's the family dynamic and then there's the society and then historically um especially for women how we've been told to live and how we've been told to look yeah. it's so messed up. Have you found any connection between dreams and eating disorders? Um cuz the girl, I don't know if you saw the most recent video I did on eating disorders. Yes, were you sharing your personal? Yeah, and like I 
didn't know this, but like her and I both often fell into sleep paralysis when it was like mm. its peak, and we both were kind of visited by like this shadow that would sit on our chest. Mm. Felt like a heavy, kind of like dark, like masculine presence for for both of us. And I remember like when I was going through that, I was like, "What is this?" and I didn't want to tell anybody and so it kind of feels like again like kind of validating that I was like wait somebody else had that experience so wow you know to be honest um when I was working at this facility a lot of the patients were really heavily medicated so their sleep was like just either it was either like all or nothing, to be honest, like they either were not sleeping or they were like sleeping all day. So that was something that they were really like recalibrating. But I do think, you know, how we eat and our rhythms with that directly affect how we're able to sleep for sure. And then, you know, some of the people that I worked with, they would have dreams of specifically like reliving their trauma and like people in their lives that did cause a lot of harm. They would show up in their dreams a lot. Their subconscious was showing them like, this is the thing that you, it's like, hey, pay attention to me. You know, I'm trying to make myself known in all these different ways when you're awake and when you're asleep. Waking life is like half of the the circle and then the dream kind of completes some of the things that like when we're awake we don't allow ourselves to to feel or see or it's more of a subconscious process how do you think um media plays a role in ed so i mean we we kind of said like it's like the pressure of it but do you did you find any other ways that it kind of played a role the pressure the what is portrayed like the public opinion of what beauty is um and even like how people are represented like what like for example the adolescents that i would work with all they would really have as an example are you know people their age that are in movies that, or they see girls that are their age that are objectified for how they look or like certain body parts that should be a certain standard. So there's like, this is the standard that we show and this is like what we're representing as this type of body when it doesn't really have a spectrum of like what truly each person and across difference at all because it's just inaccurate and not diverse in any way. And I do think with that generation and I'm thinking of them so much, but even our people our age and I can see how the older generation is like completely disillusioned with social media, but how so much is like carefully curated now and how you know things like airbrushing or photoshop you you feel like oh well i need to look this way i need to dress this way i need to buy this in order to look like and feel like this right i actually love what you post too i see sometimes on your story where you see like the side-by-side images of like instagram models where they have like this is the real photo or this is the reality and then this is what is posted and it's so crazy how much it's changed i try to really post those things like to show because i'm like okay i know like maybe somebody's going through their timeline or through their stories and they're seeing all these great photos i was like so let me try and put something into like the internet ether and just you know so somebody can see that healthy image that is true image i think it's so important i think the images that we see really impact us oh my gosh i'm reading the book uh the body is not an apology by sonia renee taylor oh my gosh it's just so powerful and she she just talks about how no matter what body you're in, but the more marginalized you have been, the more that you've learned to apologize for yourself. Like, again, like taking up space, like I'm sorry for even existing. 
And usually at the healing, like the core of the healing that I would hope to get to with someone is like you are, by inhabiting your body and by being who you are, you can exist and that is enough. Like just by existing, you don't have to apologize for being here. Mm -hmm. You know, like almost like people think that there's an, um, a mistake or that they have to apologize just for existing. And that's when you see things like suicidality too, that tends to be comorbid with eating disorders and eating disorders in them of themselves are life threatening. You know, it's like a slow way of killing yourself eventually. And so it's really sad. It's incredibly sad. I mean, in part of my role, there's this other book by this man named Yalom who he writes about like specific cases throughout. He's a um, psychologist and it's called Love's Ex Executioner. And he just shares his own like humanness of like working with people. And one of the cases that he shares was he calls her the fat lady and she's just, you know, incredibly obese and his own countertransference of like what comes up for him around being around fat people. And it's just so incredible because just how he describes this whole process of working with her and how she, she was unburdening her like worthlessness. And then he was working through his own countertransference of like, what is it like to sit in a room with this person who hates themselves so much and then him being triggered by it too like his own biases and it's just so it's constantly like that when you work with people if i'm across from anyone i mean i i truly don't know what it's like to be in their shoes i can practice empathy but the more that i get to know the person the more that there is that like the energy exchange and then this person is like projecting onto me and then I respond and that's, that's therapy, you know, but the more that I can be aware of like my own internal reactions, responses and biases, I, you know, then I'm able to be more of just a witness, but I don't pretend to be neutral because I don't want to be a robot, you know, I want to be human. And so I think it's important to acknowledge those moments of countertransference because it's like, yeah, this person, you know, brings out my mother parts or this person really makes me pissed off. And what is that about, mm -hmm. you know, and then using that in the relationship. And so when working with people with eating disorders, I tended to I'm just remembering like moments where I would, my huge protector parts would come out, like wanting to protect these young girls from things that have happened to them, even though they've already happened. Or there are moments of, of disgust where I would notice my tolerance for like being around people talking about purging and binging and purging and all of those, like those kind of shadows of, of the human psyche that, I just hadn't like dealt with yet inside myself. So I think it's just so important to keep in check. Did you find that eating disorders affected women in a particular way as opposed to men or were they very similar? I would say in some ways they're similar, the same kind of themes that I mentioned at the beginning with like control and like how people take up space and then the trauma that is underneath. But I would say for men, it's, it's different because in general, just getting in touch with emotions was just completely foreign. Mm. This is just generalization, but the vulnerability that's required to do this work and like unpack all these things from people's pasts and, and to own those things, men in general did not have the tools to do that. So we would start like further back with like, okay, these are basic emotions and it's okay to feel these and it's okay to show them because that sense of protection would show up only as anger and anger would be the thing that would be societally or culturally appropriate to show for men. 
And so like the softness and the sadness would have to be like, it would have to be coaxed a little bit and like for them to feel really safe to begin to show that sadness that's underneath the anger. But women have no problem in general, you know, being in their sadness from what I've found. Um, and then it was actually the opposite, how women needed to express their anger more and be more outright with that. Um, Cause actually with, binging like binge eating there tends to be like sort of a stuffing down almost I mean quite literally like trying to stuff down emotions or experiences physically with food and so and it tended to be anger like I'm trying to just stuff this down and I, I don't want to feel it and so there's a lot of like tolerance building of okay you're feeling this thing can you go past your threshold a little bit more today or in this moment. And there's nothing wrong with anger. There's nothing wrong with emotions at all. We just need, like, I think there's just this fear potentially of feeling them fully. And if you have a pattern of stuffing them down or repressing or not acknowledging them, then they can be really scary. You know, it's like slowly acknowledging the the thing in the room, the dark corner that you haven't like approached and slowly like shining a light over there. And usually in that process, it's not as bad. Like once you shine the light, you think it's this big monster, but it's like a little tiny kitty, you know? It's like, not that. it's like, I don't know where that image came from, but you know, when you start to finally face it, it's not as bad as you think it is. Creating a container to feel those things is so important and then I think people also are afraid to identify with it like especially with anger people say well I'm not an angry person I'm like great yes you're not but you can feel anger it doesn't make you an angry person if you feel anger and I think especially now we're in a time where we feel like we don't have control so I'm sure a lot of people are turning to feeling you know oh, I, I, at least I can control this and you know, I've seen a lot of people, like we were kind of mentioning social media, like on Instagram, like so many people posting like their workouts and like, mm. how are you staying in shape during the pandemic? And it's like, like personally, I've been working out a lot, but like I always did already. But now I find that like, there's some people I'll see like say things like they're like, oh, I've gotten so fat over quarantine or say like, oh, you know, I'm not how are people working out? I can't. And it's kind of like, if you can do it, great. But if you can't, like, you know, I think it's so difficult right now, especially because really our social, like, where we can be social right now is on social media for the most part. Mm -hmm. We don't have these other ways of, like, being social outside of that now. So now all we see is, like, these great images. Right. And that reminds me, that's a huge part of what we did at that facility too, was there was a, a fitness person, like a, there were classes that they would go to specifically for like regaining a healthy relationship to working out and to moving their bodies. And there were actually like levels that people would be on in terms of like their ability to work out and one of them was exercise restriction where they were not even able to engage in fitness yet because they weren't, their bodies weren't strong enough because mm -hmm. they were on the brink of whatever comes with their bodies not being strong, you know, breaking bones or just respiratory problems. And for me as a dance movement therapist, we would move a lot in groups and, and, there would be this kind of line where I would say, no, those people on restriction need to be in my group because I'm not doing fitness and that's the whole point, right? It's like using the movement in a way that is healing and not harming. So how can we engage in movement that makes us feel good and not so much externally motivated in terms of like, this is what this is what I, this is how I want to look like not so much goal oriented or productive. Although of course that's powerful 
if you have a balanced relationship with it, like, please, yes, get those, get that muscle bigger, you know, but like, that doesn't really matter in the end. I, I always ask people, like, how do you want to feel in your body? What is the feeling? Not what you look like. Yes. And then the irony is the, the better you feel, the better you're going to look, too. But it's all about how do you feel inside. Yeah. Absolutely.